Good afternoon. Um, we are here again at the second of our Andrus uh, AARP Distinguished Lecture Series, which um, is the highlight of our year here to have these extremely distinguished scholars come and speak in honor of the long-time relationship that AARP and the Ethel Percy Andrus Center have had together. Ethel Percy Andrus was a graduate of the University of Southern California and the founder of AARP. And so this we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of AARP by bringing distinguished scholars to talk to us about a number of issues in aging. And because both of our institutions are really dedicated to the idea that aging should be a time of dignity and a time of independence and a time of meaning and purpose. And so we are delighted today to have uh, Daniel Schachter here to talk to us. And before I introduce him, I just want to say that I'm giving the introduction today because our Dean Gerald Davidson is not here and he sends his regrets. He has landed in Dubai uh, today where he is at a World Economic Forum where they are talking about issues of aging and I guess they'll solve those problems. <laughs> come, he'll come home and it will all be better. At any rate, he is off in Dubai. So we have the honor of having Daniel Schachter here today. He's a Kennan professor of psychology who has come to us from Harvard University. He has received his degree, uh, bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina and his PhD from the University of Toronto. And he has received numerous prizes for both teaching and research from a number of organizations over his career. And um, that uh, is something to celebrate, but um, something I heard yesterday from my colleagues in psychology is perhaps an even greater feat that there seems to be agreement that his books are among the most readable books um, in psychology. And if you're interested in memory, my, my uh, colleagues tell me that you should go to Amazon and get his, uh, one of his two books, either Searching for Memory or his uh, more recent book, The Seven Sins of Memory. And they, uh, it's unusual for academics to wax eloquently about how someone else writes and is so readable. So I really look forward to this talk talk by Daniel Schachter. Um, come. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks to everybody for uh, coming out uh, to hear the, to uh, the talk today. And uh, my topic, of course, uh, is, has to do with aging. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on not only kind of a traditional look at or a look at a, a traditional topic in memory, which uh, in memory and aging, which uh, concerns has, how memory uh, changes as we age. I'm also going to be linking that up to kind of a newer topic that has to do with how we use memory to think about uh, the future. We think of memory as being primarily concerned with the past. Today, I'm going to try to make some links up to how we use memory to think about the future and how that changes uh, with age. But the starting point for my talk today actually comes a, a little bit from the book, The Seven Sins of Memory, which talk to, talks about seven, wa seven ways in which uh, memory is imperfect. We all know from everyday experience that our memories aren't like a tape recorder. They're not perfect. And uh, this leads to a variety of errors that we, young and old, both uh, can make in memory. And these errors can be very revealing. Uh, many of us in the field think about how memory works and why it's generally uh, serves us well most of the time. So to illustrate one kind of error I want to get started with today is kind of our entree into aging and remembering the past and imagining the future. I want to talk about uh, an event that uh, most of you in this auditorium are probably uh, familiar with and this of course is the tragic uh, Oklahoma City bombing uh, uh, which occurred now uh, some 13 years ago. 
And as you all remember, uh, the individual pictured uh, here on the right side of the slide, Timothy McVeigh, was ultimately uh, uh, convicted and executed for his role in the, in the bombing. Uh, you may also recall that in the uh, days prior to, uh, or just after the bombing uh, occurred, there was a, an, an FBI search for not one, but two individuals. And at that time, they were called John Doe number one, who turned out to be McVeigh, and John Doe number two. John Doe number two was this guy here pictured in the, in, in the cap. And interestingly, John Doe number two was never found. There was somebody else involved in the bombings, Terry Nichols, but that's not who people thought John Doe number two was. And the reason why John Doe number two, uh, most likely reason uh, he was never found, is that he didn't actually exist. Or he didn't exist in quite the form that the FBI was led to believe. Rather, John Doe number two turned out to be the product of an interesting memory error. It's a memory error by, made by a guy named Tom Kensinger, who was a mechanic who worked near the body shop where McVeigh rented the van that he used to carry out the bombing. And it was Kensinger, Kensinger who was there and remembered being there the day that McVeigh showed up to rent the van that he used to carry out the bombing. But he remembered there were two people there, McVeigh and a guy who fit this description, which was given to uh, uh, the FBI. Well, to make a long story short, what ultimately turned out was that this guy had indeed been at that body shop, but not with McVeigh, and not on the day that McVeigh rented the van to carry out the bombing. He was there the next day with somebody who kind of looked like McVeigh, and his name was uh, Todd Bunting. He was a private in the U.S. Army, a totally innocent individual who had nothing to do with, uh, with this, um, with this uh, uh, event. Uh, Tom Kensinger had mixed up in his memory uh, one event with another. He was right about what this guy looked like, um, John Doe number two, but he misattributed his memory to the wrong time, the wrong context. And this is a classic kind of error in memory research that we refer to as a source memory error or a misattribution uh, error. So I want you to keep that, uh, keep that in mind as, as kind of an example of the kind of error that human memory is prone to, mixing up bits and pieces of different episodes and sometimes melding them into episodes that never occurred. Well, this kind of thing was known to a psychologist who, who will be familiar to the other psychologist in the room by the name of Sir Frederick Bartlett, who way back in 1932 published what turned out to be a very prescient book on human memory. And Bartlett, pictured here, uh, said uh, something that I think most of us today would agree with. The first notion to get rid of is that memory is primarily or literally reduplicative or reproductive. He noted that in a world of constantly changing environment, literal recall is extraordinarily unimportant. Memory, from his view, uh, appears to be a fair of construction rather than reproduction. And these basic sentiments from Bartlett are going to weigh heavily in this talk. Uh, he reached these conclusions based on some studies he had made at the time of errors people make when they recall stories that he gave them. And he found they didn't recall these stories like a computer would. They made very interesting kinds of errors, some like the one we just saw in the Oklahoma City case, uh, in which people link up bits and pieces of information incorrectly from different sources, sometimes confusing elements uh, of an episode, sometimes intruding their general knowledge of, of events into their memories for the story. So when he talks about memory as a constructive process, and when I talk about memory as a constructive process, this is what I mean, the idea that it's not just a, a, a readout of a computer file, it's a much more active process where we've got to link together information from different sources uh, in various ways. And I think Bartlett was also on the right track about the function of a constructive memory. Why would we have a memory system put together like this? Why wouldn't we have something that just replays like your computer does, stores a file and brings it up exactly the way that it was, it was, um, it was stored? Uh, our memory doesn't seem to work that way. And I think he was on the right track in thinking about the function of a constructive memory, why our memory is put together the way uh, it is. And that is one of the relevant points, is that we don't often need literal recall. 
in a world where the environment changes. We don't need to recall things typically exactly uh, as they were. Well, let's pursue this question a little bit further because this is going to inform my talk on how memory, uh, how constructive memory changes with aging. And just ask the question of what functions might be served by a constructive memory system that Bartlett discussed versus more of a rote or reproductive system. And I want to I want to make two points that we'll use to kind of guide our discussion of aging memory. One has to do with them and refer to as economy of storage and picking up a little bit on Bartlett said, what Bartlett said, and that is that, again, we don't often need to store all the literal details, every little detail of what happened. It's often much more important to remember the essentials or the gist of our experiences. This has adaptive value. Um, uh, because we, we tend to remember the important things, the regularities in the environment that are predictive for the future, uh, but it can produce memory errors, uh, as we're going to see. So this is one, I think, one argument at least for the functional basis of a constructive memory. And a second one, uh, uh, I think is, uh, this is something that is a little bit more recent and comes from the thinking of, uh, uh, of our lab and a couple of others. And this is the idea that perhaps the constructive nature of, of, of our memory, episodic memory, which I'll define in a minute, uh, also uh, makes it useful for building simulations of possible future experiences. That is, we can access our memory in a very flexible way in which we can take bits and pieces of past experience and kind of project them into the future to imagine different things that might happen to us without engaging in the actual behavior. That saves us a lot of work. We don't have to behave in every possible way to find out which way might work best. We can use our memory flexibly to think ahead about and imagine various alternatives. And I want to suggest that this uh, requirement for flexibly accessing past experience in this way uh, can be a benefit can help us adaptively in, in preparing for the future, but it also can produce memory errors. So in today's talk, I'm going to talk about two lines of research that examine some of these issues uh, and how uh, aspects of constructive memory change with aging. Uh, first, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some work. This is older work from our lab uh, on the analysis of uh, so-called false memory errors, memory mistakes. Uh, that reveals that these errors aren't necessarily flaws in our memory system, particularly in our aging memory system, but rather they can be based on some of these adaptive constructive processes that I've talked about. And second, we'll talk about some more recent work we've been doing, and this is on the theme that memory, which we usually think of as the ability to retrieve past experiences, is also important for imagining our, our futures. And we're going to see some evidence that brain regions that are traditionally associated with memory are engaged in a very similar way when we imagine the future, and then we're going to look about how look at how this activity changes, or the cognitive aspects of uh, imagining the future change as we age. And we'll be focusing here on what I referred to earlier as episodic memory. This will be familiar to many people in the audience. For those who's not, this is a this is a term that dates back to Endel Tulving, um, psychologist who I worked with many years ago. Uh, and it refers to a neurocognitive system that enables us to remember our past experiences, what we did, when we did things, and so on and so forth. And that's distinguished from semantic memory, which refers to kind of general knowledge. Procedural memory refers to knowing how to do things in a variety of other forms of memory that we won't be getting into today. Okay, uh, let's, let's begin by uh, talking about um, memory errors. And uh, how many people here are familiar with, uh, I know that some of you are, a, a paradigm called the dies rodeger mcdermott or DRM paradigm. Raise your hand if you know what that is. Okay, a couple, couple people do. Well, you, you folks have to be quiet because uh, we're going to do a little memory demonstration now for, those, uh, for the benefit of those who don't know what this uh, paradigm is. It's a way of producing memory errors. And in fact, I'm going to make a prediction now that within the next few minutes, we're going to be able to produce a very striking memory error in a majority of people in this auditorium. I'm kind of telling you what I'm up to, and now I'm going to see whether I can follow through and do it. So what I want you to do is just pay attention uh, to a bunch of words that I'm going to read. Okay, I'm going to read out to you. Listen carefully, don't write anything down, and then I'm going to give you a memory test on them later on. 
Okay, here it comes. Remember these words. Candy, sour, sugar, bitter, good, taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, cake, eat, pie. Okay? Um, bunch of words, relatively easy. Uh, to understand those words. Now what I'd like you to do first is just try to rummage through your mind and recall silently or write them down all the words that you can that I just said. If you have a pen and paper available, write down all the words that I just said on that list. And if you don't, just kind of think back through the list and see what you can remember. Anything less than 10 indicates severe brain damage, so you better, <laughs> better get moving. That is just a joke. I didn't hear Okay, so you've got at least some of those words. That's uh, wh what we call, uh, as many of you know, a free recall test. Let's now do a recognition test. I'm going to say a word out loud, and if um, you remember that word being on the list, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, we'll do a bunch of these words. And if uh, if you're, and then I'm going to ask you if you're sure or not sure about your response. The first word is taste. Was that one of the words that I said? Okay, a little more than half people said. How many people are sure taste was on the list? Okay, roughly half or a little bit more than half. Uh, good. Uh, how about point? Anybody remember point being on the list? All right, you guys are pretty good. Nobody remembers point? Okay. How about sweet? Most people remember sweet. And how many people are sure about sweet? About 70% are sure of sweet. Sweet was not on the list. <laughs> so I told you what I was going to do. I was going to try to get you to commit a memory error. And despite me warning you, there you go. 70% of the people in this room, somewhere 60 70% were sure that I had said the word sweet. I, I promise you I did not. Uh, this interesting paradigm was something that was first discovered back in the late 50s by the psychologist James Deese and was kind of revived and rediscovered and extended by Rodiger and McDermott in 1995. And so here's what just happened. You got all these words, candy, sour, sugar, bitter, good taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, etc. I tested you with wor one word that was on the list, taste. Many of you remembered that. Then I gave you a totally unrelated word, and you all correctly avoided false alarming to that. But then you fell for this associatively related theme word. And the key here is that this word, of course, is related in association or, and or meaning to all of those words that were on the list. Okay, That's what kind of causes this memory error. By the way, how many people wrote it down on your own? Now, don't be ashamed. You can raise your hand. Yeah, a number of you also wrote it down on your own. Well, uh, this turns out to be a very convenient way of producing powerful misattribution errors with very high levels of false alarms to the theme word accompanied by high confidence. And going back a number of years now, Ken Norman, who was then a graduate student in my lab, and I did a study where we compared college students to older adults in their 70s on this task. And what I'm showing you here is the proportion of times people said old to words that really were on the list, like taste, and the older adults did that a little bit less often than the younger adults, but here's the interesting result over on the right. This is how often people said old to the false targets, like sweet. And as you can see, people say old to the false items as much as they say to the uh, items that really were there, and the older adults actually did this to a greater extent than did the younger adults. Uh, false alarming uh, to that uh, related lure item that wasn't there, but you're darn sure that it was there. And we thought this was kind of a neat discovery. Number, a number of other people found the same thing uh, around this time. We were a little bit disappointed when we found out we had been scooped by none other than Mark Twain. And here's what he said. When I was younger, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not. But my faculties are decaying now, and soon I shall be, so I cannot remember any but the things that have never happened. <laughs> It's sad to go to pieces like this, but we all have to do it. <laughs> well, 
are the older adults in our sample here really falling to pieces because they're remembering uh, uh, having such a high rate of misattribution or false recognition, even higher than the, um, than the college students? Well, let's look at a few other studies and gain some perspective on what's going on here. Around the same time when we started looking at this paradigm in a variety of populations, we did some studies with patients with uh, organic amnesic syndromes. These are people who have damage to the hippocampus, which is uh, probably the, the kind of the, uh, the holy grail of memory research, a, a structure tucked away deep within the medial temporal lobe that we know when damaged through disease, uh, through stroke, uh, early stages of Alzheimer's disease, loss of oxygen to the brain, can produce a severe inability to uh, remember new experiences. Patients with amnesic syndromes do very poorly on standard laboratory t uh, tests of memory. They can't remember what happened to them yesterday. Uh, they may remember some events from many years ago b prior to their uh, onset of, of the brain damage that caused this uh, uh, memory disorder, but their ability to form and retain new experiences is very poor. Well, we did the, uh, we did the DRM uh, false memory paradigm in a series of studies beginning in the mid-90s with these patients, and what we have consistently found is shown here where we look at amnesics and we compare them to healthy elderly, in this case, older adults who are um, in their 60s, because the mean age of, uh, uh, of our amnesics was in their 60s. And I'm just showing you here the results for how often you false alarm to words like sweet, the related new words, versus uh, how often you false alarm to words like point, the unrelated new words. And what you can see here is that, yeah, the, the uh, healthy elderly adults, again, are false alarming at a very high rate, but the patients with brain damage are the ones here who are not making the mistake, who seem to be doing better. Why is that? Why is that the patients of brain, with brain damage are actually seem to be, in some sense of the term, doing better and avoiding false alarming to this related lure word, even though they actually tend to false alarm a bit more to the totally unrelated words? Well, we think what's going on here is that this false recognition error is actually driven by your ability to remember kind of the general sense of what has been presented before, the general sense or gist of the items in the list. There are probably a couple different reasons why this uh, memory, particular memory error occurs, but that's one of them. Um, and so our results are, suggest that our healthy older adults are kind of forming and retaining uh, uh, a memory of the general gist of the list, and that's what drives people to false alarm in a high rate. The amnesic patients are the ones who are seemingly uh, doing better by uh, avoiding making that memory error, but looks like my pointer here has just failed me. Um, but they are, um, they, they in fact are so poorly uh, doing, uh, their memory is so impaired that they don't even remember the general sense of, of what they've been presented. Now this can be illustrated by us, uh, uh, this point can be illustrated nicely with a slight variant of this paradigm that we've also done, where you kind of change around the task instructions so that, um, help is on the way, uh, thanks. You change around the task instructions so now, instead of asking you, was the word sweet on the list, I changed it around the question a little. And what I ask you is, um, do you remember any words from the list that were related to sweet? Okay? So now, it's the correct to say yes to sweet if you remember what was related to it. So we'll skip over some of the details here. We just did a comparison. This is an uh, instructional manipulation introduced to the literature by Brainerd and Renya back in 1998. We did the same old test and uh, we compare that to the meaning instructions where now it's the right thing to say, yeah, I remember sweet was related to all those words I heard earlier. And what you see is that, um, the uh, again, comparing the healthy elderly controls uh, to the amnesics, is that the healthy elderly actually go up a little bit when you make it the right response, because they remember a lot about the gist of the list, where the amnesics, they just don't remember anything in either condition and their performance doesn't improve. So again, this seems to indicate that um, this memory errors actually reflects the operation of kind of a healthy memory system. Older adults are a bit more susceptible to it than our younger adults because with aging, we tend to re have a harder time remembering a lot of the specific details of what has been 
uh, presented to us, and there's lots of evidence uh, on this point. So we have a good memory for the gist. We're a little bit fuzzy on the specific details, and that's a recipe for a high false recognition rate in that paradigm, but it does reflect kind of uh, good memory for the gist. And indeed, we've done neuroimaging studies of this paradigm. This is one published a few years ago, a collaboration with Roberto Cabeza's lab, where we put people in an fMRI scanner after they had heard a bunch of lists like the one that we went through. And uh, we scanned their brains uh, while they were making responses to uh, old words that really were on the list, like taste, that's the red line, um, the related words like sweet that weren't there but they thought were there, that's the brown line, and then the totally new items like point where they correctly say it wasn't there. And what we're showing you here is an image, uh, kind of a hot spot in the hippocampus, that critically important region for memory we know about, and we're showing you the strength of this fMRI signal, which is me measuring um, blood flow through the brain uh, in particular regions of the brain. And so when we see these hot spots, that means these, uh, these regions are taking up a bit more blood than they uh, would in a, in a control condition. And what you see is that this hippocampal region is active to a similar degree for the true words that really were there and the false items that weren't there, but think you were there. So again, it's reflecting real memory, but um, it's real memory for the gist of what happened. So let's summarize this first part of the talk. There's neuropsychological evidence indicating that gist-based false recognition is a sign of a healthy memory system, not a defective one, and um, that these constructive processes that s support the kind of memory errors we've been talking about are adaptive in the sense that they enable you to remember or they reflect that you remember the gist of, of, of your experience. And in many situations, it's a good thing to remember the general meaning or general sense of what happened. But as we get older, um, the good news is that we remember just information very well. We kind of retain the big picture uh, as well as we did when, when we were younger. Um, but we have problems remembering specific details, and that can lead to these increases in false recognition. Okay, let's move on to part two now. And this is where we're going to link remembering the past to imagining uh, the future. Now, uh, it's a common assumption that memory really is concerned only or primarily with the past. Uh, for many of us, that's almost definitional uh, when we think of memory. Yeah, memory is, has to do with the past. But there's been a growing awareness uh, in our uh, field uh, that memory can also be important for the future as well as the past. Um, one area uh, of research that's been going on for a while in cognitive psychology is known as perspective memory, and this has to do with kind of remembering things to do, do things in the future, remembering to pick up uh, milk and bread on the way home uh, from the office, uh, remembering an appointment you've got coming up in a few days. And uh, I write about this in The Seven Sins of Memory because when you fail to carry out these perspective tasks, we refer to these as absent-minded memory errors, and that's one of my seven sins of memory. But what I want to talk about today is related to this, but a little bit different, and it's what I alluded to earlier. And it has to do with our use of memory to imagine or, or simulate possible outcomes of future events, to draw on our past, to imagine different possibilities for upcoming uh, experiences that we might have and how they might turn out. And this, what I'll refer to as future event simulation, kind of building a simulation of how the future might turn out, very important in our everyday lives. We spend a fair amount of time doing this, studies have shown, but it's really been uh, largely ignored by uh, prospective memory researchers and has until very recently been an understudy topic in psychology and neuroscience. But just in the last couple of years, there's been a dramatic increase as a, a number of people have been getting interested in this and seeing that this is a potentially important uh, topic. Um, so let's uh, talk about some of the background that has led to this interest. And this is a few different lines of research that show that there are some striking commonalities between remembering past events and imagining future events. Let's talk about amnesic patients again, who we talk about with respect to memory errors. Endel Tolvin, way back in 1985, made kind of a casual observation. In fact, I, I was with him when he did this about a uh, head injured patient who had a terrible inability to remember anything that happened to him in the past. If you ask this guy what happened uh, yesterday, let alone a week ago, he couldn't give you anything specific. And Tolving asked him 
a similar question about the future. What are you going to do tomorrow? What are you going to do next week? And this patient came up with as dense a blank when thinking about the future as when thinking about the past. All he could say was maybe I'll have breakfast, lunch, or dinner. He had no specific images or ideas uh, about what he might be doing in, in the future. And a number of years later, uh, Klein et al. and Hassabis et al. in a, in a couple of more recent studies um, basically have, have, have ex confirmed and extended this observation in, in, in a number of amnesic patients a bit more formally showing that they have a greatly reduced ability to imagine future scenes and novel scenarios that is, uh, in many ways, parallels their memory deficit. It's kind of surprising. Uh, there's been, there was some work by uh, Williams and his group in England back in the, in the 1990s showing an interesting similarity uh, between remembering the past and imagining the future in depressed patients who tend, when they remember their past experiences, to remember them in overly general terms, lacking specific detail, and he found that the same thing happened when he asked these depressed patients to uh, imagine things that might happen to them in the future. The future uh, uh, imaginary events that they came up with, things that might plausibly happen to them, were reduced in detail and correlated with their memory deficits. And there have been a few cognitive studies basically showing uh, that there's some individual differences and experimental manipulations that uh, influence the subjective properties or phenomenology of, of past events and future events uh, similarly. Um, for those of you who are interested in this work, we've published a few reviews on it. There's kind of a, a uh, there's uh, one that summarizes this and some other uh, work published in Nature Reviews Neuroscience uh, last year with Donna Annis and Randy Buckner. Well, looking at some of these uh, ideas and linking it to the work on constructive memory that I just told you about, about adaptive aspects of memory and memory errors, Donna Addis and I, in a couple of papers published in 2007, uh, came up with something that we refer to as the constructive episodic simulation hypothesis. And it's linking kind of the constructive aspect of memory with how we think about the future. And we think the two things may be linked. And there are kind of three uh, ideas in this hypothesis. Number one, uh, that remembering past events and imagining or simulating future events draw on similar kinds of information in episodic memory and involve a number of shared processes. Number two, that episodic simulation, trying out things in the future based on the past, requires a memory system and allows you to flexibly recombine details from past events into novel scenarios. And we think that this likely relies on something that uh, psychologists and neuroscientists refer to as relational processing, that is, a kind of processing that allows us to link or associate disparate events, and brain regions previously implicated in relational processing, including, notably including, the hippocampal region. We know from a variety of lines of research in neuroscience that the hippocampus is really important for linking or binding together previously unrelated bits of information. We think the hippocampus may play a similar role in allowing us to recombine details from the past to imagine things that might occur in the future. And three, although the constructive nature of the episodic memory system can result in memory errors, uh, we think that this attribute might make it well suited to imagining or simulating future events. So maybe there's some connection there between the fact that we have this flexible access set up it's good for using our past to envisage different kind of future scenarios, but it, perhaps it can also get us into trouble sometimes. Well, let me just tell you briefly about one study of brain imaging and uh, comparing remembering the past and imagining the future, and then go into our work on aging, how aging affects these processes, which we've been looking at uh, recently. And the, I'll tell you about this one brain imaging study, and this is kind of a cartoon from our Nature Reviews article that uh, boils down the paradigm we use to its simplest uh, bare essentials. But we, what we do is we put somebody in a scanner and we show them a keyword. We show them that inside the scanner. And basically what we ask them to do is to remember a, a real event, past event from their, from their life, and we give them a few different time periods to work with, such as remembering a day trip last summer and walking on the beach. Or we ask them to imagine an event that might plausibly occur to them within, uh, a certain, with various, within various time frames, a couple of weeks from now, a couple of months from now, a couple of years from now. So I imagine picking out a, a pu puppy at the uh, pet shop 
uh, for example, would be one, one such uh, incident. And what we're going to do is scan them while, we're, while they do these two tests, and we're going to ask the question of whether there's any brain activity uh, in common, uh, what are the similarities, what are the differences. Uh, and there have been a few other studies by other groups. I'm just going to focus on, on our work here. This is a, a, a study that was published last year in the journal Neuro Neuropsychologia. Now, uh, we also, uh, when we scanned them, we broke down both the remembering and imagining into two stages that we call construction and elaboration. So, for example, uh, suppose I give you uh, the word table, and I say, try to remember an event that has occurred to you within the last week involving a table. Okay? Try to do it. Come up with it in your head. Probably in about four, five, six, seven seconds, you'll come up with something. That's what we call the construction phase, how long it takes you to construct a past memory or to construct a possible future event. And then I can say to you, okay, fill in all the details from that memory. Elaborate on it for another 10 seconds. That's what we call the elaboration phase. And we do this for both the conditions we ask you to remember the past and imagine the future. There are 14 young adults. Um, we always tell them that the future events should be novel and plausible. We have them describe these events in a post-scan interview. They can't talk during uh, the scanning. And without getting too hung up in all the details of the uh, paradigm, which is published for those who are interested, what basically happens here is a cue comes up, an event screen. It would cue you to a, a past or a future event, give you the time frame, last five to 20 years or next year, and give you the cue word. It could be car, it could be dress. And you press a button um, when you come up with either your future construction or your, or your memory. That typically takes around seven seconds for both. And then you kind of elaborate on the details out to 20 seconds, and then we have you make various ratings afterwards. But basic paradigm is pretty simple. Well, let's look at what happens in the brain when you compare activity during remembering the past and imagining the future to a control condition that I won't go into the details on that controls for a variety of uh, complex cognitive processes but does not involve this episodic remembering or episodic imagining. And we see early on a variety of brain regions that activate compared to the control task similarly during remembering the past and imagining the future. I'm showing you a couple of ones here and I'm just going to hone you in on the hippocampus Again, that structure that we associate with memory activated pretty much to the same extent when you remember a past event and when you imagined a future event, which we thought was very interesting. And again, uh, supporting some of the ideas in our constructive episodic simulation hypothesis. And there were other more posterior regions uh, uh, that activated as well during this early construction phase. Um, but it was, whoops, going the wrong way. There was also, uh, there was also, there, was all, there were also a couple of interesting differences, and the one I'll call your attention to is there was actually a part of the hippocampus over on the right that activated selectively when you were imagining a future event. And I won't go into all the, uh, we've done a number of experiments uh, since then, but we think that that right hippocampal activation might re be reflecting is this kind of um, uh, a process of recombining details from the past to imagine the future that you would do when you're thinking ahead to the future but you wouldn't do when you're just remembering the past. So this is kind of interesting to see another part of the hippocampus activate selectively when you imagine the future. And then during that elaboration phase we saw very striking overlap in a number of brain regions that activated um, during remembering the past and imagining the future, back here in the, in the uh, midline parietal region, up here in the frontal lobes uh, toward the center uh, of the brain, you see very striking overlap uh, during remembering the past and imagining the future. And there are a bunch of other regions as well, including the hippocampus, that show this similarity. We won't go into all the regions and the various interpretations. But suffice it to say that we think there's some interesting evidence from this study to support the general idea that remembering the past and imagining the future are relying on some common neural substrates and that the hippocampus, a structure we think of as being so crucial for memory, seems to be playing possibly an important and interesting role in imagining the future. 
Okay, so now let's go to our aging studies of this process. Uh, there's been a lot of work on aging memory, but not much of anything on how imagining the future changes as we get older. Uh, we found very little uh, in the literature on this topic. It's kind of uh, largely unexplored territory. And so uh, we do know uh, something about the qualities of aging memory uh, for kind of real events that actually happen to you in your life from the work of Brian Levine and his colleagues published back in, in 2002 that we use kind of as a basis for extending into, think, in, into the future. And they uh, looked at, they asked uh, older and younger adults to remember real events from their lives, and they gave something, th them something called the autobiographical interview um, that allow them to decompose these memories into something that's important for our purposes, We're gonna, uh, that they refer to as internal or episodic details or external, uh, and external or semantic details that comprise these events. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, here's what you do in a procedure such as that Levine and colleagues use. You recall as much detail about a past event as, as you can in five minutes, and I could cue this with a word or a phrase or various other ways, and I give you a few minutes to come up with all you can. And then a couple of experimenters or a couple of uh, individuals uh, score that protocol. Um, and they, tr they, make a dis they classify all the information provided by the individual about the event into internal details. And this refers to kind of the episodic details related to the main event, person, place, where it occurred, how much of that sort of detail is in there. We're going to call that an episodic or an internal detail. External details refer to kind of facts, um, general ideas, descriptions of other uh, events, other things this, uh, that this event might relate to in your life general things you know about that. And what they found in this early study was that older adults show fewer internal details. The kind of core details of the episode are reported a bit more sparsely as we get older, but um, show at least as much, if not more, external details. So it's not that the memory is more or less. It's kind of different as you get older uh, with fewer internal and more external details. Okay. We're now going to take that and we're going to ask the question of whether that same pattern extends to when older and younger adults imagine future events, or is this something that only happens when you remember things that have really happened to you in the past? Well, from the perspective of our ideas, if both past and future events draw on episodic memory, uh, we're going to ask the question, does the age-related reduction that we just reviewed for episodic specificity of past events does extend to future events? And if this simulation of future events requires, as we've suggested in our hypothesis, flexibly recombining details from memory into a coherent scenario, do any age-related impairments or changes in episodic uh, simulation correlate with other members, measures of relational memory? Remember, relational memory is that thing that allows you to tie unrelated bits of information together. And according to our hypothesis that I outlined earlier, the answer to both questions is yes. Whatever uh, what the, the patterns we see for older adults in the past should be mirrored in the future. And there should be a relationship between age-related changes in simulating the future and remembering the past on the one hand and a separate test of relational memory ability because we think they're kind of tapping into similar things. So. Here's the study. Again, we don't need to concern ourselves with the details. It came out a few months ago in the journal Psychological Science. We're comparing 16 younger adults, a mean age of 25, to 16 older adults uh, in their early 70s. These are all high-functioning individuals, no history of neurological or psychological impairment. And in addition to the task I'm about to describe, we give some neuropsychological testing to our older adults. To get at relational memory, we give them a very simple uh, Paired associate tests where you just, we give you two words and you have to remember that those two words went together. That's our me measure of your uh, relational memory ability. And we also give some more general tests of what's called executive function um, that measures your ability to come up with words uh, from semantic memory and, and so forth. Um, 
So there are four events in each condition where we're asking you to remember things that happened to you in the past few weeks or past few years and imagine things that might happen to you in the next few weeks or next few years. We cue you with a word. You have a few minutes to recall or imagine as much detail about the event as possible. We probe you and then we score these details as internal, external. It turns out that you get really good reliability if you give this to two different people and say, are these internal details or external? You get about a 90% reliability between the two scores. So it, we think it's a reliable measure. And here are the results. And they're, I think, very striking and, and very consistent. Let's look over at this left side. This is basically a nice replication of Brian Levine's study uh, that I told you about earlier. The older adults, indeed, are remembering fewer specific details about the episodes they provide, the core features of the episode, what happened, where did it happen, and so on, than the younger adults. But they're actually remembering a bit more or providing a bit more of these external details, kind of facts related to the episode, how it links up with other episodes, and so forth. The critical new result here is that we see exactly the same thing happening when you imagine future events. The older adults are showing the same reduction in internal details and the same uh, increase in external uh, details. And here's a couple of samples to show you what I mean. These are slightly uh, extreme cases, but um, this is actually published in our review paper where um, we're looking at what I call non-episodic information. That's the external details. The episodic is the internal. These are samples from two younger adults recalling a past event in response to the word uh, keyword tree or imagining a future event in response to the keyword oven. They provide hardly any, uh, in this case, that's a little bit extreme because sometimes th they do provide some, but hardly any of these external details, like, for example, saying that something happened because I love cheese, but provide very rich and detail account, detailed accounts of the a uh, actual events. I realize you probably can't read that, but um, there's a lot in there. They went hiking in the woods of Muir Woods of California. She went with her boyfriend and roommates, went through different ecosystems. You would see all different kinds of plants, uh, and so on and so forth. The older adults provide um, fewer of these specific details about where they went and when it happened and how they reacted, but they provide more of these external details. Reminds me of something else that our grandchildren have. Uh, in the next few years, uh, um, you know, I hope we come up with alternative sources of energy to run vehicles uh, as opposed to the specific details of a future imagination involving an engine. And you can do some further analyses that basically just show that there's a very, very strong correlation between past and future in both the, uh, both the old and young for internal and external. Um, there's a strong correlation. People who provide more Internal details for the past also do the same thing for the future, same for external. Um, skip that. And it's also the case that uh, there is, as, uh, as we had predicted, a, a nice correlation here uh, within the older sample between uh, their ability to come up with the internal details of the episode uh, for both past and future events and their ability to perform this relational processing task. Those two things seem to go together uh, very nicely. Um, so uh, overall, it seems as though the findings are in support of our hypothesis. As we get older, there's a change in our ability to imagine or simulate future events that very much parallels uh, the changes in, in memory. But there are some questions, uh, questions op uh, that is left open by this study, and I'll just close by telling you about some very new data. These are kind of like hot off the presses data that attempted to answer a couple of questions about what's going on here in, in this aging study in relating the past and future. So we've seen that the older adults' performance for past and future events is very similar. But we might ask the question of exactly why this occurs. And, and one possibility that had been raised by us in response to our initial findings, that it might occur because uh, both younger and older adults simply recast memories in the future. In other words, if I say to you, imagine an event that might happen to you with a chair. Maybe you can just remember last week you, were, you uh, spilled some milk on a chair and you had to clean it off 
and you can say to yourself, well, I imagine that could happen next week. That would be recasting. If that's all that's going on in these experiments, and it's not really that surprising that we see all these uh, similarities between the past and future, because you're just taking a memory and kind of saying, well, that could happen in the future. Um, but we, we've suggested that, there, that what's interesting about this is that what we're indexing when we, when we look at imagining the future is kind of your ability to recombine elements of different episodes. But that's really the process that we think is, is critical here. But are they doing, are people actually doing any recombining for the future events in these experiments? They don't really control for that. We don't really know. So we tried to uh, design a paradigm to get at that. And also, there's an interesting question here. Are these differences in imagining future events specific to the future? Suppose I said to you, imagine that something had occurred to you a few years back and try to imagine as much detail as you can, something related to a chair. Would the performance be the same, or are we picking up something here and imagining that, that really is specific to thinking ahead to the future? So we did an experiment to try to address these questions, and I'll just describe this very briefly and then wrap up, using what we call an experimental recombination procedure, where now the critical thing is we're going to actually kind of force you to recombine elements of episodes that you've experienced in the past into a novel imaginary event, rather than just totally leaving it up to you. The way we do this, this is, uh, again, this is work that's in preparation, still under analysis, is by getting you to come into the lab and giving us a pool of memories, say 35 memories of things that have happened to you from the past five years. And what we then do is we, deco and, and what we're doing is we're looking at three critical features of those memories. Um, who was the key person there, the place that the event occurred, and a key object from the memory. So here's one uh, where the title of the memory is Fall Outside the Library. It involves Katie in front of Widener Library at Harvard, and there's a hat involved. Here's one called Buying a New TV. The key person is John. It takes place at Best Buy, and the key object is a new TV, and so on and so forth. So we've got all these memories. Now what we're going to do is kind of rearrange them for you and ask you to imagine events that might occur in the future or maybe could have occurred in the past involving these rearranged combinations. So now for the imagining the future condition, we might, we're going to take Katie from this memory, uh, and we're going to take uh, Harvard Yard from this graduation day memory, and we're going to take a fajita from this other memory. And we're going to say, imagine all this together. Imagine that this might occur to you sometime in the next few weeks. Or imagine that something like this might have happened to you in the past few weeks or months. So we're going to imagine in both directions, to the future and the past. And now you, we know, or we think we know, or that you really are recombining details from your past to form these imaginary events. Um, so it's pretty much along these lines. I say we have 18 young adults, 18 older adults. They initially come into the lab for a couple hours. They recall their 35 memories. We get the person, place, and object. And then we recombine them into the stimulus I just described for phase two, which occurs a couple of, of weeks later. The details can come from two or three memories. That doesn't seem to be important. And we're going to look at imagining the future, imagining the past, and remembering the past. Okay. And basically, uh, the bottom line is that the findings are pretty much as we saw them before. So when we separate these things out um, uh, into internal and external details, when we first look at the internal details, we find again that the younger adults under these conditions of forced recombination are providing more internal details about actually recalled events, and about imagined events in the past and the future than are old. Uh, interestingly, there seems to be some slight trend for the past imagined events to have more episodic detail than the future imagined events. But the main thing here is we replicate exactly our results for the internal details uh, in the two imagined conditions. And we get pretty similar patterns again for the external details. These are the things related to the memories, where again, it's not that the older adults provide less, it's just different. It's a different kind of memory, and it's a different kind of uh, 
imagination into the future and the past, more of the external details provided by the older uh, adults. I'm going to skip this bit on Alzheimer's disease to leave time for questions. People can ask me about it if they wish. Um, and so what are the conclusions then from these two lines of research I've talked about? Number one, we've talked about the constructive nature of the episodic memory system. Some memory errors occur when we remember the general sense or gist of past experiences, and we can draw flexibly on our past experiences to imagine future events. Those are the two points we started with. We saw that many of the same brain regions support both true and false memories as well as remembered and imagined experiences. Perhaps that provides some insights into the confusions that we sometimes have. Uh, but this enables us to uh, reflexibly, uh, flexibly recombine details into novel events and to simulate uh, the future and could also produce memory errors. And then finally, we saw two points about aging. Number one, uh, that as we get older, we tend to make these memory errors that reflect increased reliance on GIST, which has both a good, good side. We remember the big picture as we get older, but we can be more prone to uh, error when specific detail memory is also required. And finally, we saw some changes in how past and future events are imagined, less of the episodic detail and more of the semantic information. And what we're excited about now is trying to understand how, uh, whether we can uh, whether we can change uh, performance in aging uh, uh, in imagination, how broad are these changes? Does this uh, uh, go into domains of creativity, for example? Um, there are a lot of interesting questions about aging and imagination, uh, we think, that haven't really uh, been addressed yet. And we're looking forward to uh, asking those questions and, uh, questions and relating them to uh, memory. Thanks for your attention. We have time for one or two big questions. Okay. This, question, uh, this uh, seemed to be between young and old and included men and women. Were the answers different substantially between men and women? We haven't, we've done some informal checking on our data. We don't see any striking differences in our samples, young or old, between men and women. It's not really set up to check that, but just uh, based on, uh, you know, some cursory analyses, we haven't really seen that yet. We're also interested in the question of, as you notice, the, sort of the gap between young and old. We're studying, comparing 20-year-olds to 70-year-olds and trying to fill in some of those mid-ranges. We haven't, we haven't done that either. Anybody else? How about the Alzheimer's data? Oh. Thanks uh, for that cue. Um, Alzheimer's data actually add a little bit more to the case and that, again, we're asking do, do the memory, are the memory deficits parallel when you ask people to imagine uh, projecting, in this case, into the future? The answer seems to be yes. I'll, um, basically, what we did was a, uh, a, ver a version of that aging uh, experiment that I told you about where we asked people to uh, remember past events and project ahead in the next few weeks, and we decompose it into internal and external details. The critical thing here is that we already knew that Alzheimer patients, in contrast to healthy elderly, if you look at memory, show reduced memory for both internal and external uh, details in past events. Uh, and the question was, would that extend to future events? And the answer is, uh, is that it does. So it's a different pattern than aging, but again, the future condition is reflecting the past condition with the Alzheimer's being down in both and it doesn't seem to be a general problem with producing uh, information. Thank you very much. We all want to thank Dr. Schachter for a very informative lecture.